Our next speaker uh, is also going to talk about refugee resettlement, uh, but more closer to home. Uh, and uh, she's got a great presentation ready for you. So uh, let, me, uh, let me talk a little bit about her bio. She's a chief legal correspondent for America Informed and uh, has argued in the Supreme Court of South Carolina. She's been an attorney for 20 years, uh, served families uh, in this area, and, uh, and has done some great work for folks across South Carolina. Spearheaded several in, uh, initiatives and has been guest speaker on uh, radio and television. Lauren Martell. Party. Thank you, Joe Dugan. Thank you, Jerry McDaniel. Thank you, Ron Hughes. All of the co-activists that are out there. Too many names. Everybody is sitting in a seat. I mean, I just I know you personally now, and it's just an amazing community. So today I have a sword and I have a cell phone. <laughs> and I just want to use this sword to, to show you highlight right here. Freedom of speech and assembly. And that's what we've done all weekend long. And it's been amazing. Divine appointments have really occurred here. And I have just seen so many freedom loving, hard working, God fearing, wonderful Americans. Um, the verse that I wanted to just open it with is Ephesians 6 17. And it says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I really believe that we have to know ourselves and we have to know our opposition. So did anybody else besides me watch the Democratic debate last night? Yeah. And wasn't it just, you know, you have to watch it and see where they're coming from. I think we're going to win. I think the conservatives are going to win this presidential election. People are really getting motivated. People are starting to understand what's going on. My topic is refugee resettlement, and that's obviously a very serious topic. We heard Suzanne so well informed, give us so many facts that are going on. As I got involved in this program, we're gonna just go right to like lawfare. I'm a lawyer, so I'm gonna talk about my subject because I can talk about how great you guys are all day long and how great America is, and we're, we're still great and we're gonna be greater and we just need to get involved. So here's what happened, because at the end of my speech, the good news is that there's really good news. It comes all the way around and it shows that there are fruits of our labor and it's worth doing the right thing. It's always the right time to do the right thing. So lawfare, let's do some of those little screens. Do we have the screens up? Lawfare was a term, basically it came out in like the 1970s, it really isn't actually a term defined by the Oxford Dictionary. 
it almost started as a slang term. But as we know, words mean, they have meaning. And it's important in a civilized, enlightened society that words, you're talking off the same sheet of music. So when I say rape, that's illegal. We don't protect that behavior. When an Islamic man says rape, he thinks that's okay. So you've got the same word, two different things. Those kind of doctrines cannot coexist. And so what we found with the whole lawfare thing is a sort of agenda that started again with this immigration and Ted Kennedy and Joe Biden, who's our vice president, drafting this sort of Immigration Refugee Act of 1980 that everybody tries to hang their hat on, that that's where the authority comes from. But I would submit to you that this was sort of the beginning of where we saw this lawfare. And lawfare does not equal justice, okay? And in our American jurisprudence, at the law school that I went to, Syracuse University, which actually happens to be, I think Prince Ben Alweed Talil went there too. I'm not sure we both sat in the, he might have missed Constitution 101. But we're gonna teach it to him because we have authority. I am blessed to live in this great country and it's great because our documents and our founding documents acknowledge a sovereign God. And a sovereign God who loved us so much that he created us in his image and gave us free will and that is why we are free. Um, so lawfare is the illegitimate use of domestic and international law with the intention of damaging an opponent, winning public relations victory, financially crippling an opponent, or tying the opponents up time so that they wouldn't have other things to do, for example, run for school board or strategic loss or do other things. So when I got involved with the refugee issue, some homeschool moms were up in Spartanburg and they were concerned that refugees were starting to trickle in under the radar and they started really investigating it. There were other people that were involved in that group too. It is so many people and they, each one of them all of their efforts were needed for this. Christina Jeffrey, Diane Hardy, Stacey Shea, many, many people, Michelle Wiles, so many people, Dan Harvell. What ended up happening is we went and we attended a meeting in Spartanburg that these, these people got together. And it was with the woman that you just saw a picture of, Ann Richards, who's right underneath John Kerry. So the federal government is saying, we have to bring these refugees in. And some of the, 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 the people who are individuals and know the law and question authority of the government said, why? And that's what this meeting was about. And I'm willing to share this transcript with anyone who wants it. It's about 80 pages, and um, I went up there to help my friends, and we brought a court reporter. Because I think that that's what attorneys need to do now, to fight lawfare only to bring justice back in so that then we can take Ann Richards' words or her lack of words and use them against her. Yeah. Once we found out how bad this program was and what a lie it was, the enemy comes to lie, steal, and destroy, and that is what this whole program is. It is a fraudulent lie that incentivizes criminal behavior. I will not be able to rest until it's stopped. Because it incentivizes such criminal behavior that we're even allowing these little children to come in and it's, we're, it's almost a human trafficking situation. And we're paying for it. And part of the federal mandate, which is again policy, because remember, Ann Richard wasn't there in 1980 when they first made this 1980 um, act. So what they've done is they've slipped in a social agenda in these new um, policies. And they're not law, right? So as an attorney, we always go back to, where's your authority? Can you cite why you can have to bring these? What's the contract? What are the terms? And what are you relying on? And does it pass the smell test with our United States Constitution? Um, and jurisdiction. So it gets complicated because, and this is where sometimes people will just dial back. Because there's the federal element of it. There's a state element of it. There's actually a county council element of it, and then there's actually your own personal decisions and your own, you know, as an American taxpayer, you're standing, you know? And, and I would submit that anything that is so flagrantly, criminally unconstitutional as this program, each one of you 
is potentially damaged or damaged by it, you know, because the program mandates that you can't proselytize refugees and the refugees can't engage in being proselytized. So what a big lie that they turned over on the evangelical church. And I am a Christian, but you have to be careful even in your own house to see what being, you're being deceived by. And this is a huge deception. Government cannot mandate charity. And so when we have Ann Richard, and I'm not gonna read because I don't have enough time, but like I said, I will, I will share this with you. Um, Ms. Richard says in this transcript on page 35, it's true, it's true. We expect our partners to not proselytize and also that they will accept LGBT refugees and treat them with the same respect. So they're throwing in, in this refugee program, a huge social agenda. And I don't know about you guys, but I know our founding fathers fought for our right to religious liberty. It doesn't mean that everybody has to be a Christian or think like I do. It means that if you don't, I'm still gonna let you live. I'm, I might be head political correctness, but I'm not gonna be head any person for that. You see, this is the law that we have of our land. Um, so, we find out this program's bad. What do you think the next step is? We need to let our governmental officials know that it's bad. And apparently phone calls and emails don't work so much anymore. So the, the small band of activists decided to do a cease and desist letter. Our first letter was mailed on um, August 29th, shortly after this meeting. We since updated and mailed another one on November 23rd. We did personally serve the governor's office twice with a process server and certified mail. And I sent certified mail to Trey Gowdy. Actually, Alan Wilson has one too. And I had a good conversation with him, but Alan Wilson is our attorney general. And if we dig into this program and we find something that he would have standing to do something about, he needs to act on it quickly. Um, and we just need to be aware of some of those things. So this is how conservatives can use lawfare again. This is so funny. Did you guys see that screen? Oh, I, can they see that screen? My name is Charles Martel, and my greatest achievement was stopping Muslim advances in Europe. Isn't that funny? <laughs> I don't know. What's the next one? Do we have the next slide? Stop, it's hammer time. Who's ready to take back the authority of the message? You know, we have authority, and they don't, but we're allowing this to kind of acquiesce, or we just get busy. And, you know, we can't beat ourselves up, though. We, it is what it is, but once you know, how bad it is, we can't rest until we get this stopped. And here's where I circle around with the good news. So we did the cease and desist letter. I had to do so much research, and most of this I've done pro bono. Thankfully, some people you know, have come up and helped and stuff, but I care about this. This isn't about money, because our country's not about money. And we are great, not necessarily because of the world standards, and that's why I submit we're still great. We're great because we're free, because we're, we work hard, and we also are a law-abiding society. And we don't, um, it's not Hammurabi's code. It understands the value of life. This is what makes America great. We understand the value of life from conception until natural death. Um, so I went and had to go research the state plan. And this is where, so you've got the federal people, and this is why it's really easy for them to confuse everybody. Because the state people can say it's up to the feds, and the Fed people can say it's up to the state. And I mean, I actually got Trey Gowdy, and I was like, you can do this. And he's like, no, I, Nikki has to do that. And then Nikki says, no, he has to do this. Nikki says, or county council, we say, county council, you do this. No, Nikki has to do it. It's incredible game of coconut shell game. And these are our people. I'm not, I just have to call them out. And I think the reason why it's necessary is because in conclusion, when you hear what's kind of happening, the squeaky wheel does get the oil. And so there is, um, again, fruits of the labor. The state plan of South Carolina is 50 pages. This is the most insidious thing, too, that I found, is we focus on the refugees, but it also includes asylees, Cuban, Haitian, parolees, um, Arab Asians, victims of human trafficking, survivors of torture, unaccompanied refugee children. So I do some family court work, too. And so I was uh, able to find a case that literally is like the last piece of the puzzle of how this is all working under the radar and nobody would know about it. And it really puts our law enforcement in, in harm's way too. Because when you go in through South Carolina DSS, there's HIPAA rules and stuff, so it basically protects our identities. 
and also um, through the family court. So, you know, law enforcement isn't even necessarily aware. It's really bad military strategy. Like, I never served in the military, but my grandfather did, and, um, you know, I have family members who have, and for my tennis game, so I could beat my opponents to play tennis, I read The Art of War. And Art of War 101 is what we're not doing. And you use Art of War in lawfare, though. To win my cases, I need to know my client, the facts. How are we going to win this? So I always look for loopholes when I find a document like this. And of course, I found one on page four. So it basically, our state really didn't even envision what Suzanne just showed you. There are no studies by experts that project that. There's no factual basis of what this is going to look like in six months or one year or five years or ten. Um, so it does say revision of the state plan will be needed either in part or in total should the inflow of ethnic composition of clients be at a significant variance with projections and or should the availability and timelessness, timeliness of federal funds be inadequate. So we really are seeing um, an inflow of ethnic composition that South Carolina can't handle. Financially, we can't handle it. Our infrastructure can't handle it. Um, you know, we have veterans that we need to serve. We have our own people, and that's charity right there. Charity can first start at home. Um, you know. And I'm still believing that Nikki will do the right thing. You know, we have tried to get her to be aware of this, but I just think the more people that can make her aware that she can stop this program. Um, because again, just like Suzanne said, the, um, a lot of the people that are coming over here aren't gonna assimilate. And again, we're, we're using words, hang on, is it time? Is my time up? Oh. This one, and I'm willing to share this document, it's a public document, and I can email it to anybody who wants it. So I will. It's titled The State of South Carolina Refugee Resettlement Program State Plan Fiscal Year 2016. Um, so again, when we're talking about words, and one of my great activist friends who's here somewhere, Carrie, um, she is just a wonderful, driven, God-centered, amazing person who's just about educating people and getting the truth out. And she shared with me um, something that she kind of brings into the churches, because that's where really some people are being deceived. You know, Jesus didn't say, go lobby your politician, you know, to go up to D.C. and bring in people who you have no idea who they are and put them on an entitlement welfare program and isolate them and not be able to bring them to church. That's not what even our, our, our scripture says. So we need to call it out and expose it. So she goes into churches and she talks about the difference. Sharia law based on the Quran, American civil law based on the Bible, Judeo-Christian principles. We are based on a Judeo-Christian value set. And I said that, I got quoted in the New York Times, and then some little blogger called me as an, uh, a xenophobe lawyer from Hilton Head. Um, loud spoken and not too bright. I take exception with that. <laughs> but anyway, mostly the xenophobe part. Because we are brave. We're not a people of fear. And that's why we just have to stop this message of fear. We need to take back the authority, take back the territory, not walk in fear. And I actually looked up phobia, because I said, okay, is it possible that I'm a xenophobe? <laughs> and I'm not. It has to be an irrational fear. When I was driving up 95 um, and a truck started swerving a little bit, I became situationally aware. And, and that was a legitimate concern that maybe that truck would run into my lane. It didn't make me afraid of all truck drivers or you know, driving. We have to be situationally aware, and I think Ben Carson said it great today. I mean, actually, everybody who spoke today really mentioned that. It's common sense. We shouldn't overregulate ourselves to the point that we don't have rules of engagement that we can't survive, right? We're not on a suicide mission in this country, are we? We're not suicide bombers. We don't want that. So here's the good news. Lee Bright and, uh, and a few other... Um, Let's see here. Okay, he is, um, he basically texted me and said that they now, as of, I guess it was Thursday or Friday, filed beyond the pre-filing some legislation that literally has teeth. The first couple bills that they filed didn't really have too much teeth. They were, they were kind of absorptions. Yeah, yeah. 
Lee Bright and the four other guys that are signing on, and they need your help. So I was going to um, pull up what exactly the text message has said, but I can't I get it exactly right now. So I will also share that on an email. But the good news is that it actually includes and embeds in the legislation, and, and this whole thing has taught me so much because you almost even assume that, like, outsiders help draft legislation too, and legislation, and you have to really find who is drafting the legislation and keep them focused because you can see how different things go a little crazy. All I wanted was legislation that says this program has to stop now. Um, it lacks integrity. You can't vet the people. We can't afford it and it's also unconstitutional, and it basically is putting, um, incentivizing people to come over here, the border jumpers that come in through the family court, it incentivizes them, the mother will come over here illegally and get set up on welfare. The child then is without either two parents, and actually now what they do is they pay smugglers to bring like the child up, and then, um, the child reunites with the mother, and we pay for that. That's all on the family court. Like, I have a family court case where there's a court order. A South Carolinian who was in there looking for an order of protection, the case would have been dismissed because there wouldn't have been enough evidence that there was abuse. Literally, in this family court case, the judge made a finding that Honduras was an unsafe country. That's not his jurisdiction, right? So we need to just expose the underbelly of this program, and that's what I'm kind of excited about doing. Um, and I guess my time's up because my favorite constitutional sheriff is coming up. And in so many ways, the, all the speakers that were this last uh, moment, you know, we all really line up. And I think we're all going to continue to support each other. Um, we need sheriffs to get into office, like Ray Nash. We need to get him into a sheriff's office because he understands um, authority. And, and honestly, if laws are not constitutional, we as Americans have a duty to say that we're not going to abide by that law. Right? Right. right. Yeah. Well, again, I don't want to take up any more uh, time. I know everybody's tired. It's been a great weekend, but it's been, you know, long and a lot of stuff going on. Debbie Jones is another one of my favorite people. There she is. Okay. My email is martellaw at hargray, H-A-R-G-R-A-Y dot com. And I'm available for any questions. There's my other friend, Scott Cooper. God bless you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we all kind of came together and paid for the court reporter. It was like $560. But we'll, we'll talk about that. You know, God has provided in so many different ways. Doors are opening, and I'm not worried about that. That'll all come into place. But I really appreciate that you were worried about that for me because eventually when you're fighting lawfare, it's a bludgeoning battle, and you have to be provided. We have to get our treasure back. We need to sue some of these bolags that are, you know, billion-dollar companies that are moving people around, human trafficking people. You know, we need to call it out and get our money back. I know. You can. <laughs>